do much about setting up a cull or the plan for the county would be uh, the county executive uh, Jim Tedesco at this time. I don't know, I'm not a political person, but I know that it is a very hot seat. I literally did this exact um, type of interaction with people about two or three weeks ago now, I'm trying to even remember, in Mawa, where they are a little bit more persistent and they're pushing for more of a hunt because there's so much county land up there. And that's what they're upset about is the fact that the county won't open up the county land for the hunting. The state opens up the land. We have state land, we have county land. Mawa is very diverse by having both properties within Mawa. I don't think there's state land in Ridgewood. Is there? It's just county land, right? The county parks. Yeah, there's no, so that's what, just double checking. Yeah, or municipal parks, but there's no state land. So you can hunt on state land. You cannot hunt on county land. And that's what they're trying to push uh, Tedesco to open up a little bit more. So, and you touched base on the cull for Saddle River. A big part of what the cull of Saddle River is the size of the properties was a big part of it. They had a lot bigger properties where it was safer to give permission for private hunters to come in. And that was a private group, a bow hunting group that did come in and do that. Uh, I have to look this up because Carol did give me this info, which she said, someone's going to ask this. And this is a good one to add in here because I don't remember the exact numbers now. So when they did the, decided to do the cull for Saddle River, they had done an aerial thermal imaging scan. This is now five or six years ago, trying to figure out the numbers population in Saddle River. They found 230 deer for every two miles, square miles. Like that's, it's just insane. The numbers that we were getting in Saddle River uh, were just insane in all fairness. And the call has worked. The numbers are way down. The accidents are down. But again, it's a different town than Ridgewood. It's just bigger properties where people aren't as close to each other, where it was more of a possibility. I'm not sure Ridgewood has the property for it. I'm not. Somebody say, I, that's just my opinion from the properties that I see. But that would be something the town would have to discuss if they wanted to do a cull. Um, I just don't know if the properties are big enough for that. And as I said, a big part of it is there isn't legal hunting in Ridgewood. Um, this conversation with Mawa, again, there's legal hunting in Mawa. You can go and hunt on private properties and everything else. Ridgewood does not have that. So back to your original question, is there anything else that we can do at this time? Really, as I said when I was talking in the presentation, a lot of it is overfeeding. If we can control the numbers of feeding, hopefully get the numbers down. It's through attrition, really, slowly. It's not something other than you're talking about with a cull. Or, or cutting down on numbers in a faster way with a hunt or something along those lines. Aggressively harassing them, chasing them, noisemakers. Um, Lillian, I think it was Lillian Vernon, I think was the name of the magazine, made this cool little thing you attached to your sprinkler that shot them. It saw motion and would shoot motion. And what? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen a few people use that. And actually, it was somebody in Mawa who showed it to me, and it worked great for them keeping the deer off of the garden. But again, deer get used to things. If you do something a lot, they get used to it. So you have to change it up. Running out there, you know, send your kids out with a super soaker. Go get the deer. Yeah, I, there's, there's not much. They do get used to us. So you have to change up your tactics on a regular basis to really keep them at bay. Dogs work great keeping them out of the property. If you have a big enough dog, little dogs, they tend to just ignore at times, but big enough dogs will chase them off the property. But again, when you go inside and go to bed, they're coming back at night is the honest answer. Uh, there's a related question in the chat, and I think you've already answered it, but um, is it legal to kill, kill deer if they're on your personal property? No, you are not allowed to shoot deer, kill animals at all. That's considered animal cruelty. So yes, the state, I guess, has looked into sterilization. Um, unfortunately, New Jersey Fish and Game is the one who is in control of all wildlife in the state. They control the deer and the deer population is under them. They will not allow sterilization. The problem is putting out the bait stations with uh, like a type of birth control or something in them that they're afraid other animals will eat. It's the controlling and making sure only the deer get it. Um, it's poisonous to dogs, cats. If our domestic animals get to it, it can make them very sick. Um, I am not a state biologist. These are things that I've been told by the state. Um, maybe that's something we can bring fishing game in on. But again, fishing game and the county executive, I'd say right now, are 
kind of in a standstill with who's going to do what first is I think where we're kind of at with, with the answers we're getting between the two. You're welcome. I don't know that many people are feeding deer. I'm sure there are some, but I think the driving force, the, the food that's allowing them to reproduce is our landscaping. It's like a one big smorgasbord for them. I had a pastas you just forget about now. Um, so this is actually more of a, a village thing since it looks like this, no one's going to do anything anytime soon unless we introduce cougars or something back into the state. Unless there's pre the mountain predators. lines are coming. And they're, they're in Harriman. They're moving down. Um, so the question is, does a, four, does a limit on fencing of four feet in the village? Perhaps the village could, should consider allowing us to put up deer fencing. So and my answer to that would also be something I can tell you that on the corner of, um, what is it, Monroe and Glen, there's those tennis courts right there at that corner. There was a deer stuck in those tennis courts once, and it had a broken leg, had a broken back leg, and it was a big buck. It was in there. The cop that was with me, I can't remember his name, he's retired now, older gentleman, but unfortunately was hit by a car badly, so they wanted me to come and put that deer to sleep because it couldn't get up. It had a broken back leg. I walked into the tennis courts with the cop, and it ran to the backside, got its feet up on the top of those tennis course fence, got its front legs over, and pulled itself over and ran away. So uh, those tennis courts fences are like 15 to 20 feet. They're really high. We were both like, the, the problem is, is they tend to go over the fences. I'm honestly not sure that raising the fences will help. It may, it may do something. The deer fencing, the deer netting, I've seen that where people put those over plants. You're right. I agree with you hundred percent. They are eating all the plants. A lot of people do put out bird feeders and such, which is also what they're eating. It's part of it. Um, I don't know if there's a way that we could only plant things that deer don't eat. They tell me there's plants they don't eat, but I don't know what that is because everything eventually if you take away all the plants they like, they just go and eat the plants that apparently are poisonous to them. Like, well, no, they're not. They're eating the whole bush. Um, so that doesn't seem to be working either, just changing the plants up. But I'm not sure even raising the fences to those levels, it may cause more problems in neighbor disputes of whose fences are higher, how they look, how they're maintaining them. But it's not a bad idea if you want to bring that up with the council. Just I had to add my point of how high I've seen a deer jump a fence if it wants to get in. I'd like to make a quick little plug for a program we did here at the library a year or two ago during COVID that was on quote unquote deer resistant gardening. Um, don't feed Bambi, something like that and using native plants. And it's on our YouTube channel in case anybody is interested. But I understand that uh, young deer don't have uh, taste buds so they can just eat anything. That's one of the reasons. But before we get, I think that we're gonna talk a lot about um, controlling the deer population. But we do have a lot of questions about ticks here that I'd like to get a few questions that I just wanted to get through before we started talking more about the deer. Like um, people are wondering if there are any organic tick repellents that they can put in their yards. Um, the, uh, is this one? The, um, yeah, the one that, that is used is a uh, cedar oil. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not going to kill them, but it is going to repel them. Um, so if they're there, that'll cause them to, um, to go away, um, but not necessarily kill them. But if you use cedar oil um, consistently, yeah, you can reduce the ticks in your property. About how big were the ticks? Because I always saw them on the slides and I haven't been able to, I'm trying to figure out how to show people at home there. How big, how yeah. big are they? Yeah. Um, at the biggest, a quarter inch uh, is the, the dog tick, maybe a little less than a quarter inch. Um, yeah, I have more in my bag if you want. <laughs> well, and actually that's, that's, that's unfed. So when they, when they feed, they blow up to like little raisins, you know? So like, these are some, these are some fed ticks. Yeah, those are.
and these are these are some unfed uh, Lone Star ticks, adults. So yeah, the, obviously the adults are bigger than the nymphs. I'm sorry. Oh, the Lone Lone Star ticks. Yes. You you mentioned that uh, rodents are sort of the original vector of the uh, bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent would and, and I'm not advocating for not culling the deer. I, I certainly think that's one thing we should be doing, but to the extent that that were to take place, what, what effect would that have on the incidence of Lyme disease, do you suppose, given that the deer are not really the original vector of the, of the infection? Yeah, so um, that, that's right. Um, so deer are, deer are not, um, they're not reservoirs for, for Lyme disease or, or the majority of those bacterial pathogens. Deer are um, they're actually immune to, to those things. Um, but what deer do is they increase the tick population. Um, so they, dri they really drive the population. So we see, you know, it's a, it's a very direct correlation with the number of deer with the number of ticks. You know, so the more deer we have, the more ticks we have, and the more, you know, ticks we have, the more um, obviously nymphs and things that, that are picking up these diseases. You know, so it's, kind of, it's really a numbers thing, you know. That's a, that a good question. Uh, has, a sterilization, has a sterilization program for the uh, uh, bucks ever been considered? Again, that's a New Jersey fishing game um, conversation, really. Yes, they have. There was a um, veterinarian in Saddle River who was willing to neuter them all for us, uh, unfortunately, with his health now. Yes, he, uh, he stood up and told the state that he would do it, and Tycho's going to catch them all for me. So that was an interesting conversation. But he, uh, unfortunately, due to health, he no longer is able to do that. He donated his services, said he would donate his time to do the um, neutering of the deer. The hard part is the catching them, sedating them, waking them back up is more of the hard part. We see a lot of adverse reaction to drugs with deer. Uh, it was all over the news not too long ago, maybe a year ago, there was a pumpkin stuck on a deer's head in Upper Saddle River. It was all over the papers, everyone, it was a big thing. And we did a lot to try and catch it. It took us about a month to finally quarter, corner the deer. It was a young deer. It was able to get away from us for a while. So we did finally corner it. Fishing game came in, they tranquilized it uh, very lightly for that matter. So we still had to tackle the thing to get it off. We did. We got the pumpkin off of it, let it go. It ran off. And then we watched it for two days. And unfortunately, it did end up dying from the sedation. And it was very minimal sedation. They don't handle drugs well. It's a wild animal. Most wild animals don't handle drugs well, which is why we don't have much of a rehab for adult animals. I mean, we get baby fox, baby deer, baby raccoons. We have a lot of rehabbers for that. But the adults don't handle the drugs and being sedated and kept in cages. Uh, and that's the biggest problem that we see with the wildlife. But fish and game, it's something else that has been brought up to them about figuring out a way to neuter the males. Can we do it when they're younger? What if we had babies and we start collecting fawns and doing it? There's been all different ideas. And honestly, that's all run and managed by fish and game. And as I said, they're still kind of waiting for the county executive to make his decision on what he's going to do before they're going to make that decision. donate into that. Um, they had a lot of money in Saddle River, a lot of different families that had were well off put money together and they had all this, it was about a million dollars they had pulled together that they were going to do it, but it was a matter of the state wouldn't allow it. Um, they said, you know, of course it started with them saying, well, this is the state saying that, you know, well, you find people to do it. Well, then they had the vet, they had the families putting the money up, but they still wouldn't allow us to actually go forward with it. And ultimately they hold my license, they could pull my, I can't do it if they tell me I can't. You know, none of us can, technically, that's, they'll charge us all for that if we go against their policy. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a different species, groundhogs. I have a really big one that I think is pregnant. And 
there are a lot of big holes in my lawn. And I got to tell you, it's, it's a death trap for me to walk around regardless of what I'm wearing because I, if I step into one of those burrows, I'm going to hurt myself. What, are your, what is your antidote, if any, for kind of can you catch and release somewhere else? Can we have permission to do that through the Ridgewood um, Authority? Or do I have to just, I've never had a groundhog before, but now I have one and it's quite large. Annoying, yes. So we're, again, as I stated in the beginning, New Jersey Fish and Game owns all wildlife in the state of New Jersey. So they make all the regulations. Yes, you can have trapping done and have those animals relocated to another spot. What you do is you can order a trap right on Amazon, nice and simple, deliver right to your house. Then you call New Jersey Fish and Game and you get, let tell them you want to relocate an animal. You have a groundhog, woodchuck in your yard. You want to have it relocated. They'll give you a relocation number and tell you where that animal can be relocated to. It is very regulated. I, as animal control, cannot say you trap it. I can't just come to your house and just take it away someplace else. I don't put it anywhere. I'm not allowed to. I can let them out of the trap for you if you need help with it. But you as a resident can call Fish and Game. You get your trap identification number. They give you your relocation site. And they tell you where it can be relocated to. You can also... What? Oh, they will tell you exactly where you have to put it. It's very specific. Or you can pay an exterminator or pest control to do the trapping. Um, it, it's not easy. It's yeah, it, that's but you go through New Jersey Fish and Game, you let them know you want to set a trap, you do it before you set the trap, they give you the number and the relocation policy. You're welcome. There's a group of us who wanted to start a garden, and we were looking at all the plants that um, do not. Um, that the deer will not eat. But as other people have said, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat every single plant. Is that true? Okay, because we've noticed some, um, uh, I, th I can think it's been, it was a uh, tall plant that's growing around all the hostas and the deer are out eating the hostas, but they're not eating this uh, other plant with this, um, uh, I forget the name of it, <laughs> but it's a, it's a tall blue plant and, um, well, pretty good, medium height. And, um, and it's not being eaten by the, the deer so far. And so that's what we were looking at. Does anyone have any experience with any animals? I mean, if any kind of uh, flowers that you can plant that the deer will not eat? My opinion on that would be it's kind of like giving a kid a plate of food. They're going to eat what they like first, finish that, and then they're going to go to the next thing. I don't know this plant specifically that you are talking. It's a possibility. Maybe it is something they don't eat. Um, it just seems, honestly, most plants that are they're not supposed to eat, eventually they will when the things that they really like run out. Daffodil, they don't like? Well, oh, daffodil, she just said they don't like. Like I said, we have something on our website, on our YouTube page about that, and it includes a list. There's a link to a list of um, some plants recommended. I'm wondering if anyone knows about spraying for ticks. Can we do that as like a town or county? Want to answer that? Um, yeah, the the only the only problem with spraying for for ticks, as opposed to, um, you know, we do mosquito spraying as a for public health. Um, mosquitoes are really easy to kill, right? It's really really easy to kill mosquitoes and not much else because they're so tiny. Um, and and the larvae of mosquitoes are concentrated in stagnant pools of water where nothing else you know lives. Um, but ticks are spread out in the environment and you can't 
kill them without killing all the other insects. Um, so there's a lot of issues with, with you know, killing non-targets, um, killing bees, you know, um, and they, it requires a much higher dose of chemical. It is totally possible to kill ticks and it's, and it's easy enough to do. And you can, you can certainly do it on your property. You can have a, a service um, do it, many people do. Um, in Ridgewood, I would say of the surveillance that we've done, there's, there's few ticks in, in the town of Ridgewood, um, both in people's yards and in the woods, in the parks. There are some, but they're relatively rare. Um, so there's a good chance you don't even really need to. Your control. Um, but as far as uh, yeah, spraying for ticks on you know an area-wide basis, well, um, you know the the uh, the state and the even the, in the in the um, you know the northeastern area, there's no there's no programs that actually do that yet, and that's for that very reason that there's 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 very few targeted ways to do that. Um, you know, in order order to eliminate all the, the ticks in a forest, you'd have to spray the entire forest. Um, it's not it's just not feasible to do that right now we don't have the you know we don't have the tools that we need to do that in ridgewood we have an ordinance that forbids residents or uh, forbids residents from feeding wildlife on public property so in the parks uh, and what we don't have is an ordinance that forbids feeding wildlife on your own property, on private property. But I see that Midland Park does have that. Um, do you know how that's working out at all? Most of the surrounding towns do have ordinances to stop people from feeding on private property as well. Um, and they regulate the way bird feeders have to be put out separate feeders, your animal feeders, there's regulations on all of that. Yes, it, it does uh, seem to work. We do have, you know, better numbers with the wildlife and the, um, I guess the residents complaints as often. I don't have as many deer in Midland Park, I can say that, but it could be because of the layout of the town. You guys have a lot of parks still where there's more for them to go into woods to hide into. But yes, it does work. It keeps people from putting food on the ground and which then is gonna also cut back on the rodents, which then is also gonna cut back on a lot of the other problems by not throwing food on the ground. For some reason, a lot of people feel they just, you know, finish your dinner, throw your scraps outside, never helps. Exactly, never helps. Yeah, with, as far as the rats, I've, I've, you know, been on rat complaints where broad daylight, I'd be at a neighbor's house and I can see the rats eating the, the seed from the ground from the bird feeder, so. Um, it is important if we do have bird feeders to have something that collects the seed. I'll put the question out to all of you. Um, would you be interested in amend it in, in suggesting to the council that we amend our current ordinance to prohibit feeding wildlife on private property? So, it, uh, I'll take a show of hands. Who would be in favor of that? Not my honey. She likes to do okay. the work. Okay. Well, that is the next question. How many people would be interested in an amendment that also prohibits bird feeders? <laughs> If you live in an apartment, you don't care. Oh, there, yeah, on about in society. <laughs> um, I thought the last time I looked at it said April on their website. April, I thought it was, is when they started saying that. I'll have to double check that now because now I can't remember. It was last year that I had the last conversation with one of the Audubon people. But yes, there is certain times of year that they recommend certain things, that birds should be able to fend for themselves certain times of year. Hi, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentations. They're really informative. Um, I had a question in terms of the potential implications of NOMO May. I have to say, I participate in NOMO May. 
Um, but I was wondering if there's any evidence yeah. of whether or not it potentially could increase the risk of Lyme disease due to the fact that the lawns are higher and whether or not that actually could lead to um, uh, a better habitat for, for, for ticks to, to hang out in. Um, we do have uh, uh, a peer-reviewed article in the back that addresses that very question. And we also have Frank Mortimer here. He's, um, he's our bee master in Ridgewood, and he teaches apiary science, I think it is, at Cornell. So I'll let him address that. Yeah, and so we did post this on the website, too, nomomeridgewood.org. Um, so you can, I'm reading what I, what's posted up there. But before we went ahead with no Mombe, we wanted to make sure that this would not cause ticks. And the, the title of the article that's back here is, Lawn Mowing Frequency in Suburban Areas Has No Detectable Effect on the Black-Legged Tick. Um, it goes on to say that our results support previous findings of the lack of ticks in the lawn zone of residential landscapes. And all of these studies that, that are quoted were mostly done in New York, so very close to us. So there's absolutely no proof from peer-reviewed uh, studies that says that having longer grass will equal more ticks. And as Matt said, that ticks dehydrate quickly, so they need to be in the forest. And so basically, the farther away you are from forest, the less likely that you're have, gonna have ticks on your property. And ticks are not going to develop on lawns that have a lot of sun. And I can further go through it, but basically, no, no more may, it does not equal more ticks. Thank you. Are you suggesting that everybody clear cut their properties? Yeah, and, and so um, I know that, um, I know that actually a lot of people were, uh, a lot of people who participated were also concerned about that. Um, and so we, we did do some surveillance in some of those, those yards. Um, and we didn't find any, any ticks um, as a result of Nomo May. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's possible for, because in order for a, a tick to show up somewhere, it needs to drop off from an animal um, and it needs to molt. So that process takes about a month. Um, so it may be that that one month of not mowing wasn't quite long enough um, for ticks to show up. Uh, I'm not, not entirely sure about that. Um, but the other thing is Ridgewood doesn't have a lot of ticks in residential properties. We have, we have checked many, many homes, mowed and unmowed, um, and we, we haven't seen that. We, we, we have found ticks um, um, close to the, um, we found a few in Grove Street Park. We found, uh, we found some uh, by the, um, the right of way. What's the name of that little park there? Um, the little park by the, which one? The, yeah, there's a, there's a park and a trail. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we found a, a, a few over there in the past. Um, but as far as backyards, I mean, yard sizes, a lot of the yards are small, um, you know, you know, quarter of an acre and in some cases, you know, smaller than that. Um, you know, ticks are usually more of a problem when you have acreage, um, you know, half acre, one acre, two acres. Right. Um, and, and also a lot of the, a lot of the yards are, kind of, are clean, you know, ticks also need leaf litter. You know, um, my, most of the yards that I notice in the town are pretty clean, clean. They're free of leaf litter. Um, so, you know, not good conditions for ticks, but good conditions for, you know, for us. I, I think Pam men mentioned that, that about 50 of the uh, households that participated in No Mo May will also be involved in a Rutgers study on just to see what the, any effects um, on the tick population uh, for the people who participated in No Mo May. So that's another interesting thing. Um, Matt, did you say that um, uh, rodents carry the ticks? Yeah, so rodents pick up the immature stages. So, so the larvae um, and the nymphs. Okay. Um, so they, they, don't, they don't climb high up the vegetation right. like the adults do. They stay down low. Um, so they're more interested in finding smaller animals. So are uh, chipmunks considered rodents? Yes. Okay, I have chipmunks running all over yeah, my yard. Yep, um, there's a, chipmunks are very super active right now. Um, yeah, you're gonna see, you're seeing them all over the place. So um, what can right one now. do to control the chipmunks? <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> yeah, 
if you just say call on me. Sorry. I, I'd be interested if you know about this. Tick mm -hmm. tubes, what they do is it's basically a toilet paper tube mm -hmm. filled with cotton that's been soaked with pyrethrin. Mm -hmm. And the theory is, is that the nest that the animals like field mice and such take the cotton out of the tubes, put it in their nests for bedding, and the pyrethrin in the cotton kills the nymphs that live on their ears, basically. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a comp. There's, there's a couple different even commercial products you can get their tubes with the yeah, cotton yeah. treated with, uh, it's either permethrin or, or oh. some um, insecticide that the mouse will get on its you know, skin. And because um, mice, when they're, when they're out in the field, they're looking for things to make bedding, right? And if you give them that treated cotton, they're actually treating themselves in the process and they're, elim they're eliminating the ticks from um, their bodies. I, I think, and there's been a lot of studies on this. I think they haven't shown that that re reduces the ticks um, over a period of time, but what they what they have shown is that, in theory, uh, it can reduce the disease, the Lyme disease that the ticks carry. So, if say 50% of the ticks ordinarily carry Lyme disease, mm -hmm. um, if you do that for a period of two years, right? Because you got to you got to impact the entire generation. If you do it for a period of about two years, you'll see a lower uh, a lower percentage of those ticks are carrying pathogens because you've killed the immatures. Um, you know, that's, um, that's another that's reason why I want to keep the, the grass can do. Um, sure. a little bit, I think, um, glorious. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you have to put a lot of tubes out, uh, in a, in a, in a kind of a large area. I forget how many meters, um, but it's possible in parks. Uh, it is part possible and it, and it is done in, in backyards. Um, and it's an option. But then if in Ridgewood, the incidence of tick populations are pretty low. Yeah. Um, or yeah so yeah, we, we tend to see in residences, in the residential areas, um, they tend to be pretty, you know, a few ticks. Um, so it may be not warranted, you know, before you do something like that, it's good to know if, if the problem is actually there, right? You know, so take a sheet on a stick and brush it up against the grass. And if you find ticks, then you know, you have a tick problem. It's actually a good segue to my question then. What is Ridgewood doing to track the incidence of Lyme disease? Because I, I, there's probably, it sounds like there's a disconnect between what you guys are citing and what most of, at least the residents around me are living with. There's at least a couple of dozen people that have all tested positive for Lyme disease yeah. or five block radius. Yes. Yeah, so um, when that was brought to my attention, I did do a search on our communicable disease reporting system, and I only ha have reported 18 cases since 2018, which is, is very limited. Um, and then Matt and I had talked it's, about that uh, um, there is a, a, a lab in California that has been, uh, I guess people have been going to this lab and, and they're finding it. So it is isn't a reporting issue, which I understand that they're working on but so we we have a very low incidence of no oh, it's my neck it's my neck so Pretty important over there. The whole audio is still. That's why I asked about the incidents, just because I can tell you that we have at least at least 40 of us in just a four or five block radius that are living with it. And it is 
this is not the mm -hmm. fun version of Lyme disease. Like, hey, you just get a couple of things in a rash. This is yeah. This yeah. is the yeah. You know, we thought he was dying, right? We pulled him back, and he's going to be healthy. We hope, but it's going to be two or three years of medication to get him healthy. And we're not alone. There's a whole bunch of us. That's why I was asking about the incidents because I think there's a disconnect in the numbers. And my guess is the deer population, the county would do something very differently if they knew that there was probably 80 to 100 people that have tested positive for Lyme in Ridgewood, not 18. They would suddenly look at everything differently when they realize that, wait, this is really happening. Right. And, and that's not just Ridgewood, I'm sure. I mean, that's just what, what you know, we're seeing in our system. So I think that's more on a county or state or CDC level to, to figure out. It's, it's not. Never have, the, the incidents will never test, sorry. Correct. Right. The, meanwhile, but meanwhile, it's, it's been proven. Yeah, John, Johns Hopkins and others have actually proven that it is chronic Lyme does exist. So the CDC is not going to change it anytime soon. But because of that, that's why I bring it up. There's, there's a definite mm -hmm. problem here. We have an opportunity to just kind of go outside it and listen to what's happening to the residents and know that there are a lot of people. If, if, if somebody whose kids gets it, having dealt with what our kids are dealing with, Everyone would be doing whatever they could to get rid of the deer and call the population. I would never wish upon anyone what has happened to our children. Of course. I'm curious now. Did you find a bullseye? Did you know where he was interacted with? So we're pretty sure that he got it somewhere in that Dunham Trail area. All the kids when they're the, the Dunham Trail area that you were describing, right? We're pretty sure that's probably where he got it. It's it's a best guess. We have do have a large yard. It could be in my yard, but it's highly unlikely. It's gonna be Every kid who walks to the high school walks through that right of way. They're always going through there. They play over in Brookside where there's fields. It's they're, they're everywhere down there. There's you can you can easily see a hundreds of deer there. We think that he had a small bullseye back then, and he got the standard antibiotic treatment. And and then you know whatever they gave him for you know a couple of weeks, and then he seemed perfectly fine. And then two years later he started a long slide down, right? From somebody who could probably play two soccer games at midfield back to back and then play a lacrosse game to a kid who couldn't run for more than two minutes at a time. Couldn't get out of bed to the point where he was depressed and anxious and everything else that you go through the lists of all the things that happen when you have Bartonella and Babesia and Anaplasma. We had every single one of them. We were not alone. We only discovered it because our neighbors were very vocal and all the neighbors are starting to talk more and they're realizing they all have it. And that's when they're all getting yeah. tested. And that was the neighborhood, is that the neighborhood, Matt, did you go? We checked a dozen homes at the, at the peak of, uh, in, the, in the fall when, uh, it was in November, um, when if I go to one of, you know, we have, the county has a, a, a large number of tick sites where we know we're, we're gonna get lots of ticks and that's what we, that's what we test. Um, so around the same time when we would find lots of ticks when they're most active, we went to, I, it was around a dozen maybe homes, uh, backyards and some were, were fairly big properties where you, you know, you might um, see ticks and we did not find anything. Um, so I, I, I couldn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that's, I mean, it's all wooded. It's everything you just described as a perfect ground for them. Again, I think if you had the real stats, the county would probably behave differently and everyone would be saying, we have to start getting rid of some of the deer to cull it. Well, we probably would do things to, so to figure out. So Lyme disease is, cases are everywhere and they're not, um, in Bergen County, and, I, and I've, I've looked at it, that, that's the reported cases. Yeah. They're, not, um, they're not clustered. They're kind of randomly distributed throughout the county. Um, and you see more cases where there's more people living. Um, it's it's kind of hard to um, it's kind of hard to show that clusters occur because of a certain area or a certain tick population because it doesn't you know people um, you know people move around a lot and you could get a tick from you know anywhere, um, not necessarily your backyard the park, um, which isn't necessarily related to where you where you're living either. Um, you know so it's. Um, but yeah, we um, and and the number of uh, the number of Lyme disease cases that are reported according to you know all the protocols that the New Jersey 
um, Department of Health, um, you know, requires, so those are actual counted cases, the actual number of, um, of cases that the CDC estimates is about 10 times higher than that. That's based on, um, that's based on insurance claims. So people that, um, yeah, so the insurance company that pays for, for treatments uh, because a doctor said, yes, this is a Lyme disease uh, case, you're getting treated for Lyme. It's about 10 times higher than the actual number of cases that get you know, tested positive yeah. um, and wind up getting, uh, because if you get bit by a tick, you, you can go to your doctor and if it, was a, you know, if it was a deer tick and it was on there for long enough, you should be getting an antibiotic kind of regardless. You, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to necessarily wait for a test um, because right. the, tests, the tests may take uh, a while. Um, you may need to be infected for a period of time before that test even shows up positive. It could be too early. I don't, I don't remember the exact length of time, a couple of weeks before you'll actually show positive according to the current tests. Yeah. They, they recently amended their the testing protocols. It used to be a, a specific kind of two-tier test. That was the only one that was allowed. Just last year, the state updated that to allow um, a whole number of different other um, commercial lab tests. So there's more tests that are now allowed to, do, to be confirmatory. Um, so I don't know about this lab that you're talking about. I don't know if, it's, if that's one that is Probably not. That would know, be, be my guess. A, is not. But I, I'm lab. just saying yeah, there's probably not. That's why I say there's you know. a dis. I'm just so if it's not, sure. if it's there's not, there's a disconnect in the stats. Like so, the yeah. my insurance will not cover it because mm -hmm. he tested positive two out of five bands. You had to do three out of five. Yeah. The third. You got to well, you got to watch positive. labs, man. There are some bad labs out there. You do need I, to watch. I'm not. I'm not. What you, <laughs> this, I'm not just, just don't talk to me about the labs because the the he tested positive for every single tick yeah. born virus yeah, and, we, uh, and, and we, bacteria. We've had, we've had to deal with, uh, so when you with some other labs that tell us that kids are, they're testing positive for West Nile when they're asymptomatic. Yeah. There's, so, a, yeah. there's a lab. In the rest of us who've gotten it, I can tell you that my son's yeah. better. He's not healed, but he's definitely better. And everyone else. So my point is there's, you have 18 reported cases and I know of 40 that are probably none of those 18. And that's just our 40. And this isn't a small yes. radius. There's this definitely is. more cases than they're actually reported. Yeah. There definitely are by a factor of like 10. And that's not here. That's everywhere. Yeah. So that, that's why I say that. Sorry, where could you tell where? So Somerville School District has 40 known cases. Well, I mean, can we, yeah, if people volunteer, is there a way to count up how many actual cases there are in Ridgewood? No, because there's, because I can tell you in New York State, they, Igenix is the lab that we went through, and Igenix reports it to New York State. New Jersey does not, for some reason, isn't getting the reporting from Igenix, but there are 40 known cases in Somerville School District currently. Well, from that lab, but there's other labs too. I've tested positive in two labs. So, but that lab is very, I mean, John Hopkins uses that lab. So it's. Which we do send to to our nurses to input into the system, but so I do receive some faxes from them. All my ninety percent, ninety nine percent of other diseases go automatically reported into the CDRSS. That's why I, I recognize that lab because we'll get a fax every once in a while. Um, but I I don't disagree with you because I didn't know there was that disconnect um, until it was brought to our attention. I'm I'm like I only have eighteen cases. I I did a search. I you know I. Mm -hmm. I mean, pe people can send lab reports and they can be inputted into CDRSS, but that would, I, I think it's not just a Ridgewood issue. I think it's just, it's, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it, it would have to be like people reporting it to us. It's, you know, it's, it happened with COVID as well. You know, doctors were not reporting cases. People were calling me. It's, it's you know, so, but it's something that, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what you're really asking. So are you? So we would need people to send us the lab results and report, report it directly if their doctor is not reporting it. I can't, like there's, there's no way for me to find out unless someone's sending it to us and then we're inputting it into the system. Sure, I, I mean, it, and it can't be like a word of mouth. It has to be an actual lab report, you know. aren't reporting it, right? Like I, there are, I, my husband had it. He couldn't walk. I get you. I was there exactly. And so was ours. He was in New York, um, Pauling, New York. If I remember, I think it was, it is 15 years ago. He, he couldn't walk literally. So now thank God we're back to normal. He is, he had a liquidiosa, he had babesia, same thing. We were going through it. And what I'm so surprised about is the doctor we were working with at the time. And I wish I could remember his name. Um, my husband will remember it, but he was so good on reporting everything. And he was also one of the doctors that was going around teaching at a lot of the colleges. I'm surprised that I know there's Lyme specific doctors because there's problems with insurance. You're paying cash. I, I know I was there with you. I'm surprised they're not reporting it to the local health departments to let them know. It's not even fair that we don't know these numbers. Doesn't tell New Jersey. And I do, I do get the facts. I do get faxes, and we do input them, but not always, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, any any suggestion? And my cards back there. Any suggestion that you have? I mean, that's why we're here. We're here. I have children. I have, you know. I'm so sorry that you're going through that. I'm so sorry. And the first thing when we found out is Matt went out and swept the yard. So you know, we're trying to, and that's we're trying. I tried to have an ordinance to stop feeding the wildlife. We're trying to do all these things. That's why we want to talk to the parents and, you know, hear what you're saying. You know, we want more education. Absolutely. Let's talk further. <laughs> Uh, after tonight about setting up a protocol for inviting people to submit data and what kind of data that should be in order to be persuasive uh, to, to uh, the, the government above us. Could I break in with a couple of questions about deer from the chat? Because I know that uh, they're just before we get, um, we, I know we're wrapping up really soon, but I want to make sure to get in a question about, uh, somebody's wondering about how many accidents, i thinking they mean car crashes, have occurred in the last 12 months involving deer. I think someone said before that the police reports are in the back. I did not look up just for Ridgewood. Uh, uh, again, we work for 24 towns, so we, see it a lot. As she stated on my way here, literally, I had to stop in Wyckoff because a deer was hit by a car. Um, so I, all day, I, I put to sleep four deer today that were hit by a car, unfortunately. It is very common. I just don't know the specific numbers for Ridgewood as of now. You have other this only goes through uh, 2022, uh, but in 2019, it was seven. In 2020, it was nine. In 21, it was 18 deer, and in 2022, it was 11. So that averages out to about 11 deer uh, accidents per year, 45 over four years. That's another part. That's a, a big part of it's what reported. A lot of times they wind up getting hit, unfortunately, and I get people calling with the dead deers in their backyard, which are obviously hit by a car, but they tend to run from the adrenaline after they're hit and end up passing away a few days later in someone's yard. And I also just wanted to mention that we just um, applied for a grant and one of the diseases that we put as is Lyme disease. So, 
So we will have some funding and we will have some available staff to help with the education for it. So grab my card and also there's tick removal cards back there, please take them and share them. But definitely we can talk about this further. And one more thing. So what could be done about deer overpopulation? Well, I suppose we could have a cull, but it would have to be bow and arrow, can't be with guns. Um, you can imagine what the backlash will be for that. Uh, I know that Saddle River had protesters coming from all over the country. And after five years of having a cull, Saddle River discontinued it without giving a reason, which I find, you know, makes it look like you might not, not want to try it here. Um, really, the best thing we can do is not feed them. I promise you, it, and she can tell you the same thing. And I, it is very, you, are, you would be surprised how common to the guys, people coming upset, upset because there's raccoons walking up to people's doors. Yeah, they get used to you handing food through a door. They'll walk up to the next door. It's worked out in other towns because then neighbors are calling them in. And if there's an ordinance, then we have a right to take them before the judge. Yes, we've had homes where it's been a big problem, unfortunately. So right now, if you called me and you complained about your neighbor doing it, I can't do anything. With an ordinance, now I could send them a letter, ask them to stop. If they continue, we write a summons, we take them to court. So that, that is being you know proactive on it. So... We could have a cull in Ridgewood and it might not be effective because the rest of the county hasn't participated in a cull. It is. So, I mean, it really something I, I, I don't know who can, you know, really motivate. Is it, you're, it's kind of confusing. You're saying, well, Tedesco is the person, but then it's really the fish and game. Like, how do you really, who do you motivate to try to, you know? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. It's been an interesting discussion. And thank you to Don Citrullo, Kim Nangle, and Matt Bickerton for all their... Uh, insight and for protecting our public every day that you're at work.